Hi everybody, my name is Jason Boss. I am a researcher and a tour keeper and I have been researching what I believe are the criminal enterprises and the doings of the Hallelujah Scriptures now for the last four months. In the last four months, I've run across many witnesses and many eyewitness testimonies of the ways that the Hallelujah Scriptures have been doing great evil on the backs of the people of our Creator. One of the very first people that I ever ran into is somebody who I have nicknamed Scribe Theodore, simply because he has put together probably one of the very best pieces of evidence that was more than a decade ago. The, when I started researching this, I had to go to places called the Wayback Machine. I had to go on various places and piece this together. And when I found a PDF, which will be provided in the description below, which is, a again, a very, very good summary and not a summary, but a complete story of everything that happened about a decade ago. Now, the thing about the Hallelujah Scriptures is this was everything we're going to talk about today was about over 10 years ago. Since that time, they have continued on. And I believe that they are in the millions of dollars in the ways of donation fraud and abuse that they have done on the backs to the backs of the people of our creator. So it is my pleasure and it is a I really appreciate um, Ted Ramp coming with us today and being able to talk to us a little bit about his endeavors 10 years ago and get this on the record for everybody who's been following this. So without further ado, Mr. Ted Ramp, how are you? Doing all right. Glad to be with you, Jason. And for all who are listening to this, uh, prayers are with you all. Uh, it's been quite an endeavor. And as Jason has reached out to me several months ago, and uh, asked about this, there was a plethora of information that I could share, uh, some of which he had found, and there is much more. And obviously, circumstances have not changed, but have gotten much more significant since the time that we were involved with uh, Deb and Ken. But I'll be glad to share what I can. Absolutely. Well, thank you very much. Now, this takes us back about a decade ago, and prior to you, there were only a couple other people that had been doing this. Can you take us through basically how you ended up in the hands of the Hallelujah Scriptures, how you ended up doing what you did, and, and take us just through that journey? And again, everybody, we'll be leaving the PDF at the bottom, and I, there's no way we could ever touch everything that goes on in this PDF. Um, I spent a good four and a half hours reading through it again today, and it is just a very well documented thing. So, Ted, take us through how did you end up with um, these responsibilities? How did you end up where you were? And, and give us the, the story, if you would, please. Okay, the document that you're talking about is actually a 31 page document uh, that's a PDF, and you can, I, I know you went through that word by word pretty much which shares everything, but basically in uh, October of 2011, uh, a friend had introduced us to uh, Holy Scriptures. They found them online through their website uh, because of some other uh, Torah observant people that were they, they had shared some, some time with and just mentioned this particular website. Uh, we went there and found it quite compelling. Back then it was quite different than what it is now. It was not nearly as large and intricate, but um, we had prayed about it, thought that it would be a good idea to share and support such an endeavor. We did not request any Bibles uh, initially and just simply began to uh, give donations. I was contacted shortly after that via email and, uh, and I'll use Deb because uh, there's not Shalom there, honestly. Mm -hmm. um, but she contacted me using the name Shalom and asked if I, you know, how many Bibles I wanted. And I said I didn't request Bibles. This was simply a donation. And so as I continued over the months, uh, we got a contact uh, a few months later asking to actually have conversation through Skype which we did, and uh, she talked, I, I had a, an open mic with my wife and children, and uh, she just shared a little bit about the story. She asked if I had seen the, the video on how, how Logia Scriptures get started, and uh, I said I had, 
and that uh, we, we just talked a little bit about the difference between Australia and um, the United States because she claimed that she lived in Australia, that was her base, and that she'd lived there her whole life, and that was her, her starting point. Huh. Um, I shared several things about uh, an idea I had. I said, you know, if you ever considered um, actually taking the Holy Scriptures and uh, turning it into a dramatized version. And um, I, I mentioned that there are some apps and different opportunities out there that you can get online for free that have dramatized versions. One of them is Bible Biz, and I listened to that a lot. But years before, I had actually started recording uh, the version that we had, uh, which at that time was the Scriptures. I also recorded some portions in uh, the complete Jewish Bible, but I wanted to use the name of Yahweh and Yahshua uh, so that my children grew up with that. So I recorded like 27 different books in the scripture, both Old and New Testament, and shared the idea, which she thought was compelling. Uh, and it was just a couple of days later that a an email went out announcing that they were going to do, Holy Scriptures was going to do a dramatized version. Uh, that was very compelling to me. So I contacted them. She sent back a response saying, well, this isn't for the, the scripture dramatization yet, but can you send us a sample and maybe record an audio version, uh, a, an audio script of the history of the Holy Scriptures? And I said, sure. So I did. I had my own equipment. And... Um, did that to start out with. They liked that. That was actually uh, what was posted. And if I'm not mistaken, my voice may still be the voice that's on that history video. Hmm. Uh, it was Alan Horvath's initially, but then it became my voice for a while. And any of you who actually have the audio of scriptures, uh, I was the narrator for the Torah. We had actually done much more than that. We were in the New Testament, had the Gospels and um, all of uh, Shoal's letters. I was at, actually doing the voice of Shoal as well as the narrative for the Gospels. I had recorded a bunch of other people doing parts and had worked with Alan Horvath, how I first met him, as we got into this project. The interesting thing is that I, I only talked really to Alan once or twice. Everything else was done by email. And uh, it was very clear. In fact, I have a, a, an email right out of the, the box within the first month. Alan told me all communications and all uh, decisions are made by Deb. Well, he's called Shalom, but um, I said, okay. So whenever anything was done, she responded and she drove the ship and told us that the team behind her uh, got together, made decisions, and she was the communication point, uh, which I found out later was not simply true. But over time, I spent, uh, I had my own job. I worked in uh, the construction field and uh, worked, you know, regular hours. And then in the late evening after our children went to bed, I would record and edit and spent countless hours doing that in uh, that first year, 2012, early in the year, throughout the year, until we got into uh, mid-summer or early fall, somewhere in that time frame. I don't have the timeline in front of me, but uh, I actually do have a timeline that I went back and, and put together. But um, at that point, uh, she was saying that she needed some more help in different areas, and um, they needed help with prison letters. They needed help with uh, the prayer newsletter that was starting up, which Robin, my wife, actually took that on and began to develop that and communicate with people, but it, obviously it always went through Deb first and then out to everybody. Um, so everything was channeled through her. There came a point uh, late in the year where 
there seemed to be an urgency. And she had a couple of things she wanted to talk about. One of the things that she said, uh, which was my first red flag, was that she wanted to talk to me privately without my family being around and without Robin being around. It didn't want me to mention anything to anyone and to uh, have, that I would have to trust her in this. Uh, I do not not let my wife in on everything that's going on. That is something that, as one, we don't part with secrets, mm -hmm. especially involving other people. Mm -hmm. And that was uh, the beginning of a few things that we noticed were a trend. Mm -hmm. And uh, the trend began to be that she was interested in ingratiating some ideas and talking with our teenage daughter at the time. And uh, that didn't happen. But there was definitely some indication that she was beginning to pry and have a tendency to separate. We don't do that, so uh, it's kind of like, well, maybe that's your way, but not going to let that happen. So things developed as we concentrated a whole lot of effort on uh, praying for, fasting on a weekly basis as they requested, and uh, lifting up all the people that we knew about in prayer. Then in the fall, early winter, there was a, kind of an emergency that we were given that they needed to find a new postal agent and also an accounts person that would be handling the funds that went through uh, the PayPal account and then out to pay the printer, and et cetera, um, and that they needed to have that all ready to go by the end of year because things had to move quickly and all of that needed to be transferred. Um, we obviously prayed about that and felt that it was the right move and Yah was leading us to go ahead and take on those endeavors and have uh, my wife and children and a friend of ours work on uh, packaging and mailing things out and I would concentrate on the accounts and continue doing the audio work. And um, it was at that point when um, somewhere around December, uh, she actually said, well, we want to incorporate and we, we need to have uh, a United States base and we want you to file for tax exempt and uh, all of these kind of things. Now, there, she goes on the record with a lot of people to say that this was my idea. This was not my idea. I have all of the emails since the beginning when I first made a donation up through our communication today, Jason. Mm -hmm. uh, I am one who likes to document because I've seen too many things go awry when people are left to just think about what it is that they said, and mm -hmm. especially when they are critical. Uh, why it was so important that, you know, if I'm going to take on this responsibility of just being an accounts person, now she throws out the idea of we have to incorporate. Well, that would require me and my wife to be basically the, the heads of this because financially that would be our responsibility. Mm -hmm. We had to set up the bank accounts, uh, set up an EIN number, and get that process rolling and incorporate, which we did. And it was Hallelujah Scriptures, Inc., and that was the first one. Uh, there was not a Hallelujah Scriptures, Inc. before that. There was Hallelujah Scriptures, but they ran their accounts and things through the accounts person uh, under him, not under a separate incorporated Hallelujah Scriptures, Inc. So, uh, in short, that responsibility became ours. Mm -hmm. And I was not going to be uh, unfrugal, nor would I allow us to be lacking in integrity, and I certainly would follow all of Yah's instructions when it comes to practices across the board, mm -hmm. personally and professionally, always have. So we were very meticulous in how we started. She gave me the list of people who were to be on the board, which included Alan Horvath, and Manuel. Well, you, we couldn't put Manuel on there because he was not in the U.S. We couldn't get 
uh, that cooperation at that point, just said, we'll stick with uh, the people who are in the U.S. that have a citizenship, et cetera. And, you know, I didn't know anything about Alan or Manuel, really. I didn't know Manuel at all. I still don't really know him. I've just known of his circumstance. And in um, the – hang on, Jason. i got to hit something real quick. Yeah, yeah. Take your time. All right, and so for those who do not know who Manuel is, Manuel was a, another postal agent who was who was in the line, and um, there is a long line of postal agents, and so I, I have interviewed Manuel, and he is a very very nice guy, and so it seems like everybody gets very much caught up in all of this. All right, Ted. Okay, sorry about that. Oh, you're uh, fine. An alarm went off, and I wasn't sure what it was. <laughs> uh, anyway, with that being said, we got all the paperwork together, um, filed everything, had shipped that information, made the bylaws, the Constitution, all of that stuff according to uh, the incorporation status in Indiana, and then uh, shipped that information up to Alan so that he would have it and could sign it and send it back. Mm-hmm. And that never happened. Um Alan never ended up signing or sending anything back to us. In fact, it wasn't until March 14th of 2013 when he sent me an email saying, uh, hey, can you send me the uh, bylaws, the Constitution bylaws? Uh, After all, I'm a board member and I should have those. I'm like, well, yes, I've sent it to you actually a couple of times, but here it is again. Mm -hmm. Uh, And I'll explain what happened at that point when uh, just a couple of days later, which is what really drove this into the ground. But anyway, he had been sent that information, and we were told to set up to be able to receive the funds that were coming from the accounts brother that was uh, that had the, the funds that were being collected through the PayPal and things. At that point, you transfer that stuff over in blocks to be able to uh, start using that those funds to pay for the scriptures. So it was uh, within a few weeks of that, she had arranged to get the new, uh, or to, to get the shipment of 60,000 plus Bibles and other books at that point, which would include uh, Hanak and Jubilees and Jasher, those were, and the Names book, those were the four that they actually had, had printed at that point. And all of those were in Georgia. Uh, Marilyn Nave and Eric Klausner were the two individuals. Their names are on this document. They actually have testified and kind of put an affidavit in their signatures in this document um, and put their testimonies up on the website that we created shortly after these events that I'm talking to you about. Uh, and they had been involved uh, throughout 2012 uh, taking care of the things in the United States. So a friend of mine and I, in December 30th of 2012, uh, went down to Georgia to pick up all of the Bibles, packed them up, and then they were shipped in a semi-truck and made it back up to our area in Indiana where we unloaded all of them on the 2nd uh, to start shipping them out in bulk. Uh, we had actually been asked in late November, early December to start shipping. We were shipped some, uh, a small shipment of Bibles to start processing and Deb would send us a list um, of addresses and we would send those out. So we already started shipping things uh, before we actually got fully incorporated and got everything settled there as we developed throughout December. It was a whirlwind of activity uh, with the audio going on, with other things going on in our life, and uh, this just took an enormous amount of time from all of us. Oh, and by the way, the claim that there were no teenagers involved in shipping or helping out, that's simply not true, uh, period. Uh, 
Uh, but anyway, that, that was another side issue. Is that uh, is that something that she brought up, that there were teenagers involved? No, well, ours were. Right, so, right, right. Uh, and, I just remember hearing other testimonies that you talked with people, and she was so elated because teenagers had not been involved with uh, helping in holiday scriptures and packing them. That's just simply not true. Most of what she says, I can't say everything, but most of what she says when she's... Uh, trying to ingratiate herself to other people is uh, schmoozing and deception and, uh, quite frankly, lies. I concur um, fully. So, and, and I can document why I'm saying what I'm saying. If anybody wants to see more, there's plenty. But uh, So we got the Bibles. We had already started shipping out small orders and developed some processes and spreadsheets and things. And in the process of setting up the incorporation and getting all of the, the legal things taken care of, there's also a, a status to get nonprofit that you have to submit certain paperwork, uh, plan designs for the development of the business, three and five year plans, those kind of things that have to be submitted in the state of Indiana uh, to get that nonprofit status mm -hmm. so that you can be tax exempt. Mm -hmm. uh, you can say that you have it. As you're working on it, and that's good, but if you don't come through in the first few years, uh, then that is revoked. And I'm going to have to take a quick pause to let my dog go. Yep, I'm sorry about that. Okay. Sorry, guys. We have nine, We have ten pit bulls here as well, so we try to keep them very quiet. All right. Wait for Ted to make it back because that was actually my bad with the dogs. Those should be the only interruptions that I have. I'm sorry. That was my fault. I am sorry, Ted. <laughs> that was my dog that started your dog. I am super sorry. Uh, no, that's all right. My wife and daughter just got home, so uh, they were interested in hearing this as well. But Great. anyway, so the the process that we went through, uh, we had a couple of we had some time to be able to develop this. Plan, and I will get to that in a little bit later, but that was a critical move in uh, two months from the point that we're talking about that changed everything. But all of this was done at Deb's request. Uh, it's not that we had any problem with it. We didn't. We're like, we'll serve however Yah wants us to. We take nothing from anybody. Yah provides for us. I work and take care of my family, and that's the way it's always been. So... From that point, uh, things really got moving. Uh, we started shipping out uh, everything from, you know, amounts of 300 Bibles at a time to a single paperback to uh, a plethora of different books and different styles, whether they were the, the fake leather or whatever. Um, we ended up with the small ones, too. They were printed while we were, that shipment came in. Um, so there... There was a lot going on, and one of the, the challenges in setting up the accounts is that I had to get, uh, I had set up a PayPal, and I had to drop the PayPal money from the bank over to, uh, or from the PayPal into the bank account so that I could then wire money to uh, China at that time for printing and then provide whatever uh, processes we need to print and continue to ship out. And I've got all of that documentation as well uh, because I was responsible for it. And uh, there was not as much funny business as you've been able to disclose because, quite frankly, we would when she said she wanted a bunch of money sent to certain locations, it's like, I, I need to know exactly what that's for and I need to have receipts or invoices or whatever. And that kind of put her off for a while. There were a couple times in, when a small amount of cash would have been uh, sent in a Bible to a certain location in New Zealand, and it was odd, but okay. It, she was a little odd, and we didn't get all of that at that time, but didn't realize what all was going on. And then when she sent some invoices and receipts, certain things that were going on in New Zealand, which were to a particular location, which you have been I, I've documented as to what it is and what those things were. Uh -huh. I won't go into those details. You can read, read them. But uh, we sent payment for some of those. But when things got a little dicey as to what she wanted money requested for and she couldn't give me a good explanation, it's like, well, just send me the receipt. Uh, you know, let me document what's going on because I'll put that in minutes and we can share that with with the team and with the board and make 
sure that everything's on the up and up. Um, but what really became a problem is the shipping. Uh, we had set up a nice little area, and uh, our, the location of the Bibles were just down the street in a conditioned um, storage area. So we would pick things up, bring a bunch of them back to our house, and then uh, ship them out as needed. But all of the shipments came as requests that were put on a spreadsheet that Deb provided to Robin on a regular basis, whether it was every day or every couple of days or whatever. Uh, we never got the direct information of where Bibles were supposed to go except from Deb. Now, I saw the PayPal account information come in, so you know there were emails and names attached to those donations, but obviously there were other ways. And we also set up a P.O. box, so when checks were sent for Bibles and requests were made, they all went to that P.O. box, and we put our address, our P.O. box address, in every Bible that we shipped uh, so that people could find more or share that with others. And so we got thousands of letters across the months that we were doing this. Uh, prisoners' letters came to us, and that was another issue which I documented in there. She did not want bulk amounts or even you know, five or six to go to a single prison. Uh, if, they, if one prisoner was there and two of them requested two different Bibles, she would say, well, you can give them one, but make sure there's a donation attached to that. And if not, then they can wait for a little while. And I've got the emails that testify to that. It's, you know, I'm not making this up. Mm -hmm. uh, and I can give you specific instances on each one of those ones. But after a while, uh, it started getting to the question, well, as to she would send something, have you sent this yet? No, we don't even have anything on your sheet that says that we should send it. Well, you didn't send the right amount to this address, and it's like, that's not on this sheet, but we'll send what we need to send. So we started checking and cross-checking this to make sure of what was sent, when she sent it, and what we sent out, and we have a nice little system to have a check and balance of errors. Mm -hmm. And yeah, sometimes you lose things in the mail. There were a couple of um, things that came back to us um, that were returned not deliverable. Mm -hmm. And so we double checked those and resent or contacted um, Shalom and said, you know, we're, this came back to us. Do you have any idea what's going on? She says, oh, well, you sent it to the wrong address. Here's the address. Like, it's a wonder how she kept finding these addresses. But um, it, became to be a, it, it became a problem because he constantly was critical of our making mistakes. And so Robin would respond, this is what was sent. Here's the spot on your sheet and the address and what was requested. And then she sends back a different request, same name, same address, and says, we'll ship this out. And he blamed us for mistakes. It became a problem because she kept on agitating and basically told me that uh, she would communicate all information about uh, shipping to Robin, and I was not to discuss those things with her. I'm like, no, uh, you don't control what goes on in my household. So if we have difficulties that we need to work through and systems that we need to work through, that's a team effort. And that's where the problem was. This was the first time since they started where they had the accounts, the business, and the postal agents all in one location, which is how we were able to figure out there's something wrong. There were amounts that she mentioned. There were returns that she requested on PayPal that didn't make any sense and told us to ship out Bibles anyway. And then there became some questions as to... Uh, Bibles being sent out with no information on PayPal in large amounts. And I'm like, well, how are, how are you getting this information when the PO box is ours and, you know, the PayPal account for any donations and requests of these things is ours and that stuff comes to me first, then you consolidate it and send, me, send Robin back the emails or the uh, postal addresses. And it started raising some 
curiosity, so we were asking questions, and she, whenever you ask her questions, she gets frustrated and angry. Yep. Uh, and at that point, there was no reason for us to get frustrated or angry. We're just trying to figure things out and make sure that there weren't any problems and that people would get the us. Uh, but then there became some issues about the prison ministry and saying, well, we have these people who have requested, and we have a, a, an aging lady, you can tell by her signature and her, her written letter that uh, this is not, you know, a, a pretended situation, and she told us not to send them. So, we did, uh, yeah, anyway, the next phase uh, that became a problem was, uh, this was now a couple of months into it. It only took us three months, basically, from uh, mid-December to late February, early March, to realize that this was not what we thought it was. There's some shady things going on in the background. In the meantime, uh, when I first got the book, the, the Bible, shipped from the previous postal agent, uh, she had contacted me once, talked to me on the phone, and said, this isn't what you think it is. You've got to be careful. And don't believe what she said. I've done a lot of research, gave me the whole nine yards, and I said, okay, I, I hear what you're saying. Uh, that's not the experience I've had, so I will hold that back my head. And when these things started happening, I reached out to both her, Marilyn Nave, and then Eric, who had been the uh, account's brother. I said, I have questions, because I'm seeing some things that are not consistent in communication and requests that are being made, and I'm asking you for your witness as to have you seen these kind of things, and do you have any more information pertaining to this? That opened up a whole lot. And before, just as that happened, one of the things that we were given was an email saying, don't ever talk to a man named Bill Meyer if he ever contacts you. Uh, do not have any conversation with him. Uh, he is evil, and we didn't have any idea who he was. Uh, even at that point, we didn't realize Bill Meyer was tied to uh, this description, this ISR, and to description research. Uh, even though we had been using the scriptures for several years before we had heard of the Hollywood scriptures, um, we didn't know who Bill was until shortly at, at, after this point. And uh, when I reached out to Eric and Marilyn, and again, this is documented in the 31-page uh, document, uh, they shared with me a lot. And uh, involved the previous postal agent that was still doing some stuff with the uh, prison ministry that she wanted Bibles for uh, that had been in Florida. She's also included in this doc documentation. Thank you, Nance. And Nance and I talked as, long, as well as we had a conference call with all of us and shared notes and began to realize that this is a lot deeper and broader than any of us expected. And... Um, so at this point, we were uh, pushing ahead to get the final paperwork done uh, so that we could become nonprofit status officially. And that required information from the uh, supposed translation team, the Holiday Scriptures team, because I couldn't you know, give a full background of, of where it came from and all those details and had to come from them. So I requested information from them. I said, we need to have a plan because that's required where they can deny that status and you just won't have it. And I put them in their letter requesting, telling them exactly what's required. And she said, in no uncertain terms, um, no, that's none of your business and we don't have to give that information. I'm like, well, you can't get the status unless you do. And so can you please answer these questions? And that became a bit of an issue, which then made us really suspect as to what the Hollywood Scriptures team was all about and why they wouldn't respond to anything. And the only one we've heard from at this point had been her and Alan. Uh, so we began to document everything. Uh, in a little more detail. 
which is what this document ends up being. And looking at the real cost of things and uh, realizing that uh, they had incorporated uh, putting out the main traditions and wanted us to do that, which we didn't want to do and didn't do. Uh, but the long story short there, when in March, things got to a volatile level of she was sending some very caustic emails uh, and tried very hard to push back and put us in our place, per se. And I said, look, I've got liability with all these things, so I need some answers. I'm not trying to be rude or insensitive about it, but you were the one that asked us to do this. So you need to cooperate with this because we have the responsibility. Alan never chimed in on any of this until the very end, and I'm not even sure that Alan did write what you wrote to me because it seemed not consistent with emails I had received from Alan before. But in short, uh, in the second and third week of March, uh, we had sent an email out saying, uh, we know what's going on, and uh, we have some real reservations about this. It was general to start with. And then it got very specific. And the kickback that we got from that said, okay, we're no longer going to be part of this. As much as it pains me to stop the audio and to not even finish the whole project, we had finished the tour at that point, but um, there was much, much work that had been done, and it wasn't going to come to fruition. And, you know, it was heartbreaking for us, for the children and everything else, but it was, the stress level was incredible because we had been collecting uh, tens of thousands of dollars through the donations, sending that out in, in postal uh, in printing and postage, and a little else because it wouldn't allow anything else. But there was something going on in the background. So when we got to this point, I received a letter saying cease and desist from all activities. Well, I had already sent a letter which is contained, you'll see both of these letters in the documentation, that um, we were going to resign from being postal agents and accounts brother, and she needed to find somebody immediately to take care of those things. And that we return all the documentation, uh, we could, you know, have them move forward with the bank accounts um, and transfer that information over. That's when they said cease and desist, and at that point, it's like, okay, you just escalated to this. It escalated this, because they told us they were going to be sending an accountant and that I needed to turn the funds, the bank accounts, and the business over to this accountant immediately. I'm like, I can't do that. The Constitution of Bylaws requires us to turn the funds over uh, or to do this in a specific way if we were going to step down, and I'm not going to let you have an account that's got my name on it, my social security check to the EIN number, and other things that are involved, because you've already proven yourself to be reckless, and we already knew that. So at that point, uh, we sought a lawyer to dissolve disillusionment of the corporation that we had started. If this was not a suing of public scripture. This was not us going after anybody. It was, we started this corporation at the request of somebody else, not working out the way that we planned, so we're going to dissolve the corporation, uh, disseminate the money according to the Constitution and bylaws, and send their bylaws back to them and be done. And in the process, the day that our, we contacted our lawyer, uh, he, he checked on our status, and that entity, uh, Holiday Scriptures Inc. Indiana, and I say Indiana because they started a, pencil, or a, a New Jersey version, um, had been dissolved. That there was a quote unquote unanimous vote, and they dissolved it and started a new corporation. Which, uh, in the, the end of this, uh, as we went through the court case, 
a judge in this case who had been a judge for 30 years said he'd never seen anybody pull off what they did. They went online and they dissolved an entity having no authority or responsibility or capability of doing that and actually stole the EIN number and started a new uh, uh, corporation with that and new bank accounts. And after our lawyer said, uh, evidently, you, your corporation has been dissolved. And I said, that's not possible. He said, it is. You can look at it right here. He sent uh, a letter out because we were then contacted by a lawyer. And I took that information. This happened you know, lightning fast within just a couple of days. Um, I took that to him, and he responded to the lawyer and, and sent a uh, – a point of reference to say uh, we were going, you know, our, our, uh, who we're representing, Mr. and Mr. Graham, came to me to dissolve this judicially, and uh, it is disheartening to hear that your client, Alan, Alan Horvath, uh, unilaterally acted and dissolved the institution without their knowledge or input. And so that creates a different circumstance than just dissolving it. That now becomes a litigation. And that went on for a year. Uh, it wasn't until 2014 that that was actually dissolved completely. And if that was not our fault, that was theirs. And when I found out that uh, they had incorporated, um, I can't remember exactly how I got tipped off to knowing how they would use PNC Bank, but I think it had to do with how uh, information came with a particular PayPal account. So I went to our, uh, the local PNC Bank, which is not the bank that we had our account in, uh, and I asked, uh, sat down and talked with one of the representatives there, and I said, here's who I am, here's my credentials, here's the information about this corporation, Here's my EIN number. Do you have a bank account in this name? And she says, I can't tell you that. And I said, can I talk to a, a, a manager? So she brought in a VP and said, I said, here's the situation. We are now in a legal dispute, and I have dissolved this in the process of dissolving this entity. And if somebody is using this EIN number and has started an account with you, and you are now informed, there will be some liability on your part. I need you to confirm or deny that an account with this EIN number has been started here because I did not start it. And the VP said, well, yes, I can, I can confirm that there is an account here with that name and that number. I said, okay. So I took that information to the lawyer and said, well, now we have an issue. And he said, okay, we're going to have to process this in a slightly different way, but the outcome is going to be the same. going to dissolve. We will extinguish that EIN number and be done with it, etc. All the documentation that we put together for them made an ironclad case. We did not start this on our own volition. We did not force anybody to sign anything or sign anybody's name. Uh, it was started because it was requested. We did it legally. We dissolved it legally. As a result of how it was dissolved, uh, the funds that were left had to be split into a uh, they had to go to a 501c3, uh, which they had started another one in uh, New Jersey. So uh, the disillusionment went 50-50 with the funds that were left in the account to uh, the choice to Holy Scriptures in New Jersey, and 50% of the funds left. We were allowed to choose what uh, nonprofit organization that money went to, which we uh, the lawyer wrote a check that to ISR, because after all, it is actually their translation that was stolen. Right. The Bibles went to Manuel, uh, they were shipped there, and everything was closed out. That did not stop the onslaught, but in the process of those things happening, uh, in March, early April, we flipped the switch on hollowsreview.com. And what that was is our testimonies, documentation uh, that you were talking about, that we've been talking about all along, that gives the background of this, uh, proofs and evidence, and basically signed affidavits from the people who confronted them. Uh, now, that's all the 
believe. Uh, I make one more statement about the biblical spiritual approach that we took to this, because that's how we live, and that's Matthew 18. And the initial concern of what was happening uh, with the flow of how there was running things, uh, she had said in an email, and it was on the uh, an email that went out to everybody uh, who supported the scriptures, that everybody had taken this vow that was on the website. And I said, uh, Rob and I have not taken that vow. We are president, vice president of Indiana, and uh, I would be willing to take a vow, but not this one, because here are the problems with that. This isn't done, and I actually put this in the document, you can read it yourself, but there are things that we have issues with, and she said the team met together and does not agree with us, and feel that uh, we need to take that vow, and that's not going to change, and so... At that point, when we were at an impasse, that's when we confronted and said, that again, we know who you are. We're asking you to come forward to repent of the things that you've been doing, and I listed those things. Uh, I got a scathing response, and so we incorporated a few other signatures, uh, which would be the people who were eyewitnesses to these things. That would include Marilyn Dave, George Wilson, Eric Klausner, Vance Whitaker, um, and Vance and um, uh, Marilyn's husbands also signed uh, this. And we requested from all of us that they repent and make a public disclosure of the things that they had been doing. And that was met with even more animosity. So as the scripture says in Matthew 18, after you've taken these things, uh, to the assembly, then you make it known. After you take these steps, here's your next step. You treat them like you would a tax collector. Mm -hmm. And so we made that public. And we, I, I even sent that to everybody that had been on the email list that we had that had supported all those scriptures. Uh, I sent out my resignation as president. Uh, and the process that we were going through to dissolve um, and the location of the Holiday Scriptures Review.com. And uh, part of the legal status was they tried to tell us that there was a copyright on the, the Holiday Scriptures that we had to take down the website. It's the color and the trademark and all of that. It's so like, fine. We'll change the color. Uh, we don't care about that. We just want people to know the truth. Mm -hmm. And for actually even reasons, you found this stuff just a few months back, but I have had contacts over the last decade uh, from people who have found bits and pieces and gone to my email and said, I just need to talk to you because I just found your email and, and I found the things that happened. And let me tell you my story. I, there was an older couple that we spent hours with who had invested a whole lot and had been treated very disdainfully. I mean, they were in their late 70s. Um, and when they read the whole documentation of things, they were very uplifted to say, okay, it wasn't us. We, we didn't do wrong in, in trying to be helpful in getting the word out. We were mistreated. And uh, encouraged them and, and prayed with them, as we did a lot of other people uh, over the years. So... That's it in a nutshell. I'm sure there are some questions, but uh, and that nutshell was kind of big. Sorry. Yeah. So, um, real quickly, Ted, the one of the things that uh, Deborah continues on lying about still to this day, um, in, in fact, I just heard about it like a week ago. Is she said that uh, Ted Ted never shipped any Bibles out. <clears throat> now you went over, you had an Excel spreadsheet the other day, and you mentioned somewhere. Yeah in the amount of over 3,000 Bibles that were shipped out. Can you give me that exact number? And you were only on like three or four months. Is that correct, that you were there shipping these Bibles? Correct. We started shipping in December, and, and I don't – I'm going to have to look at that Excel sheet, sorry. Mm -hmm. um, I don't want to corrupt it in any way, so I'm going to make a copy of 
copy of it, and I, there are some of the dates that are a little bit wonky on it, but um, I can tell you that there are thousands on there, and we have a point at which we started in tracking it because we inherited that spreadsheet from Eric initially, and from uh, he had been keeping track of what he sent out. And so we sent out uh, I can I could definitely say over 1,700. It looked more like 2,000 or so. We were sending out, uh, you know, I don't know how many Bibles yet. I haven't actually counted that. But the orders, like I mentioned to you at the first part of this, would be sometimes 300 Bibles to a certain location. So that's not a small order. Mm -hmm. And then there would be a variety of different packages in different ways. We had to bundle all those up and put the... Uh, addresses on them and everything and take them to the post office. And so uh, at the minimum, it was an average of between 84 and 100 a week um, over the course of several months. So, and I have, you interviewed Trish Elliott. It's kind of interesting as we listen to the interview of Trish Elliott. Uh, Robin and looked back in her emails and actually found the email where uh, it was said, Hey, have you gotten this from Deb? Hey, have you gotten this uh, order out yet for Trish Elliott? And Robin said, no, we don't have a Trish Elliott on our sheet that you gave us. She sent back the, receipt, or the uh, email with Trish 3 and said, this is where you sent it and this is what you sent. It's like, well, yeah, we had that on. Trish Reed was on there. So then there was a response that she shipped back, that Deb sent back to us, that Trish had received her Bible immediately, and she was thrilled with how fast she got it. Um, and we've got a lot of documentation about how quickly things got out. Were there mistakes made? No doubt. Were there misaddressed uh, information? Yes, because we got things shipped back to us, and we found out that there were things that she sent to us that didn't even have addresses. We had to find those people and figure out a way to get certain things to them. Um, and every time you brought any, you know, did you look this up? It looks like there was a mistake here. He got furious and basically said, no, mm -hmm. you had, you know, what I need to make sure that you get it right. Okay, we'll work around it. But, um, yeah, I can, the, the number on that sheet is larger than 2,000, of which I know that we had, uh, the majority of those, I just want to make sure that, you know, if I'm going to give a number, I want to be accurate on it. So yeah, no. I'll go low. That, that, that's I can have no less than a thousand shipments. Uh, so, yeah. And okay. I say I, it was the whole family. Absolutely, absolutely. Now, and I and I just want to recap this. And for at the very minimum, there were it looks to me what if I just do rough math about two thousand anywhere between seventeen hundred two thousand orders. There was at least eighty some transactions or something that you guys were doing every single day for months on end for no pay whatsoever. It was only to the father. So you know this is something that she's doing right now. Is she's She's going on a war path against everybody in the U.S. And she says that everybody in the U.S. has, so for some reason, if you're in the U.S., you, you are a thief, you are dishonest, you become a demon when you deal with the Hallelujah Scriptures, right? This is her M.O. And, Ted, this is like a, a 10, over a 10-year M.O. She just did this to the Elliots. She just did this to the Parks. Now, what I've noticed, and I've... Go ahead. I was going to say, she also did it to some people in England, which I won't about. She also did it to some people in New Zealand, mm -hmm. and I won't give their names. Right. She also did it to several people who are in the United States whose names I will not give because I talked to those people and I have their information as well when we did the documentation. Some of them were not willing because of the damage that they did to their families mm -hmm. uh, that they would not go back you know, and, and want to put their name on something. And I understand that. Yep. I really do. Yeah. And uh, what she actually had, something I didn't mention, is that she had a man from Texas who was rather wealthy, who literally threatened me 
But let me ask you some questions about what you're doing here and how you got here and what's going on. And when he started listening, he's like, wait a minute, what? And I said, so who's paying the retainer for that lawyer? He said, I'm not paying that. They have to. I got a phone call the next day after he had visited the lawyer. He said, I can't believe it, but she wanted me to pay that retainer. <laughs> like, is that a surprise? He says, can you tell me more? So we talked at length about the things that were going on. And he was selected as the next president on the New Jersey side of things. And he, I have his resignation letter because they used his name. And he says, I want my name and anything to do with me and my name and my family off of anything Hallelujah Scriptures. He sent that to me and to them demanding or that he would take them to court and clean their clock. Mm -hmm. they, they said they... However, they did not remove all of his information. Right. They used it along with other people that are dead and have continued to root. So, yeah, they have mercilessly used lots of faithful people and left a way cooking across right. the last decade plus. Let, now, let me touch on this real quick because the, the, the pattern that I have seen with Deborah and Ken is that not only do they enslave a family and every family thinks that they are doing the will of our creator, but then at some level they try to almost like a torture the family or try to um, make their lives horrible or just bring some sort of, um, I don't know if it's an unclean spirit or what it is. Have you noticed that? Is that what, can you Absolutely. concur? That's what I was trying to explain. In the emails that were uh, accusing Robin of making all these mistakes and shipping. And when Robin was put scripture in the prayer list, she did not like that going out, so she took that away from her and said, I will take care of this now. And the reason she gave it to her to begin with is she didn't have enough time to do all the things she wanted to do. Mm -hmm. So whenever you take something on, if anything bothers her, she begins to get offensive. If you draw that to her attention, she becomes vindictive. Mm -hmm. And the vitriol that she spits is beyond description. Mm -hmm. And the emails that were flying at, at her and my, my wife, um, obviously, Robin and I were in sometimes separate rooms doing work at the same time for HS. And she would show me or send me an email. And I said, uh, that's interesting because I just got this contact and this directive. And they were opposite. Almost as if it was intentionally, no, it was. It was intentionally trying to drive a wedge to make me see Robin as incompetent and not able to take care of things, which she actually told me. At, at not, not Robin, but Deb told me that, I'm sorry, it just seems like you know, Robin really has a difficulty keeping things straight. And I'm like, <laughs> uh, at that time, we've been very uh, over 20 years. And uh, I know my wife, and one thing she is not, along with it, she is a faithful believer and follower, but she is not incompetent when it comes to uh, meticulously taking care of my details. Right. She homeschooled our kids from zero to graduation, so she's a little bit meticulous on things. Right. And the constant badgering and intentional pecking get us divisive with each other, I can document. It's not just hearsay. I can show you the email threads that go from, well, oh, there's this, and then we document the problem, and it's like, no, you sent us this. Here's the location on the sheet, or here's the, this communication that you sent before. Quote her own words in a previous uh, email that she doesn't realize she said, and then you send her the entire email and say, well, here, here it is highlighted. This is what you said. And that's when she just, you know, the things come out, and she was vicious. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Are, are we dealing with somebody in your, in your just an opinion only? Is she mentally ill, or are, what, what are we, you've been dealing with her for a decade now. I've seen her for four, four or five months. I have witnessed testimony from her, her children, her older children, that says she has mental issues. From what I can tell, not only is she mentally, mentally ill, and, and almost like a, a I would say schizophrenic at, at some level because she comes across and she's always talking in we or they or the project 
or or really culty culty style words like it's almost i don't know like there's multiple people in her head is she normal or what are you what are your thoughts Hi, Robin. <laughs> Hi, Robin. <laughs> Hi. Okay, to answer to your question, normal, no. Uh, I've also, before you even came along, had these conversations with her son, and who is in New Zealand, and who filled us in on a whole lot more of the background when we were digging in to find out where places were and where things were spent and where money went, and uh, uh, gave us a background that is very dark and twisted, and the things that he and his sister went through uh, were were terrible, and uh, he was, it was, probably still is, very afraid of her, and uh, I, I'm not going to give an out by saying she's mentally ill. I think very realistically she knows what she's doing. I think she is maniacal with it, and it's very clear she has no repentant heart. She has been given multiple opportunities because actually Marilyn had confronted her. She sent Marilyn sent me the letters that she sent to Devic then before she had shipped the Bible to me. And those you know, I, I've seen all of that documentation. She had drawn up found out the connections that were in New Zealand. She knew they didn't live in Australia. And she said you need to repent. They did they got worse. They got more maniacal, they got more devilish and things and continue to manipulate people. And, you know, we gave a heads up to the people that they had picked as postal agents in the U.S. to take them place and said, you need to understand some things. Please read this. And they chose not to be involved, which obviously is true. But we didn't get any response from Manuel. Never, I, I don't know that he ever got anything that I sent. I don't know that he ever saw anything before things happened and a uh, big burden was laid on him or what was going on there. They really don't know that story. Yeah, and, uh, and so she did with, and she, what she does with everybody is is the isolation tactic. And she has had so many different postal workers that every one of them go with the exact same orders. Whoever they're going into is dis, is not trustworthy. They're there to attack the word. You cannot trust them. Don't say a word to them, right? And I do, right. and I find it extremely fascinating how you and your wife described the isolation and the the like literal um, like this would be a psychologist um, textbook something if, if somebody in the psychology world could could study Deb and her tactics I don't know where she came from or what she learned as a child but there's literally um, words that people use for her tactics where it is divisive and it is it, it we've seen it with other couples as well where they will try to break the couple down they will. Um, they always play the, um, we don't want to talk to the woman. We need the, the woman's making mistakes. We need to talk to the man. There's the man. And everybody that I have found over this, this 13 year run has been very, very great people. Starting with you, Ted, and your wife, and all of the people that I've interviewed, I, I found nothing but very nice people, extremely credible people. And, you know, that's the one thing with, with Deborah is that we do not see is honesty in any way, shape, or form. And let, let me, do you believe the Hallelujah Scriptures is a criminal enterprise or a criminal organization? The Hallelujah Scriptures is definitely criminal. And, I, I mean, I would go a step beyond. It's not just legally criminal in our country or in other countries. It, it's sinister by definition of evil from the Scriptures. Yeah. The, the First Corinthians chapter 5, verse 11 through 13, where it talks about a person who claims to be a brother uh, and is greedy or an infidel, a swindler, a poor. Uh, do not associate with those kind of people. You do not even eat with them. It's very clear because Shaul was dealing with that in his day, dealing with the Corinthians, mm -hmm. and people would come in and they would claim to be self-righteous or Righteous, etc., and just did not. Uh, they did destruction to the the Corinthian people. Mm -hmm. uh, he says, "For what? This is verse twelve. For what have I to do with 
judging outsiders? Do you not judge those who are inside? But Elohim judges those who are outside. Put away the wicked one from among you. We've given them. It's not just her. She's the ringleader, but certainly Ken is a lap dog at best. Mm -hmm. uh, but he's complicit. There's no question about that. And at this point, Robert Lou is too. Absolutely. And the fact of the matter is, we just found our documentation that we were the ones that sent Robert Lou his first HS. Hmm. Uh, and, and we can go back and find names that she's used since that time since we found Trish and uh, others that have been uh, documented, uh, they got Bibles from us. Right. And we sent Bibles out. So Robert Lou, you know, if you make the statement, if you're listening to this, if you said Bibles didn't go out by uh, the ranch that were in Indiana, uh, yours came from us, sir. Huh. So. Wow. Wow. Just so you know. Yeah. Well, and that's that's the whole point of this whole thing, Ted, is is getting this out in a, you know, w when this happened years and years ago, social media wasn't quite where it was. And it appears that um, y'all let um, Deborah have basically a 10 year of, of extreme greed. And, and you know, because right now I'm sitting with nearly a million dollars in properties, um, over half a million dollars in cash, thousands, hundreds of thousands of dollars everywhere. And being spent all over the place. And does it surprise you that to this point there have been no orphans, widows, or lepers that I have been able to find, or that is anything to come out of this? Did you no, think there were ever any? It, there is not any. None that I'm aware of. And all of the pictures. I don't know where they're getting pictures. I know that that you documented that they spent a whole lot of money on stock photos, and I don't know where she's getting those. But I can testify that as we talked about the, the cold climate, the weather that we were in at times, and the, the snowstorm that we had when we were talking to her on Skype, that she did request that uh, we go out and bundle up and uh, kind of give that portrayal of being Russians in the snow and send her some pictures. I'm like, uh, no. I mean, it's, it's one thing to send pictures, but if you're going to say that we're something we're not, no, forget it. Right. So, right. Who knows how many people she's got to comply. Right, right. Yeah, everything, everything. it looks to me like everything about her is a facade and a farce. And, um, well, brother I and, and sis Robin, I, I thank you guys very, very, very much for your time. If there is, I'm going to give you guys the floor at the very end. If, if there's anything that you could possibly tell to any people in the future that are thinking about becoming postal agents for higher scriptures, what warning can you give to them and, and those who continue to donate? How how do how does it look? You know that um, what is your best advice to to everybody associating with them? Let me give a, a background um, in a Second Chronicles where a very good and righteous king Jehoshaphat had aligned himself with a very wicked and evil Ahab and had tried to co-join Israel and uh, Judah within marriage and let the daughter of Ahab be his son's wife, you know, the daughter of Jezebel, mm -hmm. Athaliah, who becomes a, a, a horrible beast and destroys the kingly line of David almost to a man. And tries very hard to destroy Judah. Well, that was a result of a man who had made some very bad decisions, maybe with the right intention of, hey, we can get our kingdom to be united under Yah. Well, there comes a point where after Jehoshaphat had almost been killed, and Ahab was, and Jezebel was, and he's got a chance to uh, not align himself with these creatures, Yah sends Yehu a prophet, and his direct words, and I'll paraphrase, yeah, in Jehu, uh, a prophet, and he says, why do you love those whom Yahweh hates? And he gives a description as to, I have been very judgmental of the conduct of this king and his kingdom. And you have tried to align yourself with them, and you've tried to support, you've tried to do your thing. And I don't, you know, at this point, it, it's very clear. Yah doesn't care about 
uh, Jehoshaphat's motivation, he point blank tells him, through a prophet, you should not be doing this. Get out of the way. And as a result, a lot of things that Jehoshaphat had done, a bunch of ships and, and probably men, were lost as a plan that he had to continue to align himself with that family. And my warning would be very similar to that in that if you are involving yourself with someone who is wicked and destroyed people and defamed the name of Yah, it doesn't matter what you may perceive her, her motivation to be. Her actions speak much louder than her words. Absolutely. And the, the weight of devastation of families, young families and old, that I have seen, and I have taken those attacks myself, in fact, she did very, very much want to bury us and actually take everything that we have in the process, thinking that through the court system, they could sue to us for everything that we have. Mm -hmm. But she would have taken what we had if she could have. Absolutely. But Yah saw it right to judge in our favor, not only by himself, but vindicated us through the judicial system and things were resolved. But he was also compassionate and said, okay, I'll keep you from going to jail because you did things illegally that were actually defrauding. But you'll have another opportunity. You can repent. She has. She's gotten more emboldened, uh, more emboldened and more wicked yep. and done even more devastating things to families that simply want to love and serve. And I would caution you that something that looks too good to be true, we've heard the old adage, it probably is. And her, you know, wrangling Trish into a, this is a full-time commitment. Basically, you're swearing allegiance to Hallelujah Scriptures forever, no matter what. Mm -hmm. No. Our allegiance is to one king and one king alone. And that isn't, you know, superimposed through the HS. And her maniacal ways we will eventually, she will pay the ultimate price for that. Absolutely. And so don't, don't follow the blind. Lead them. They are blind, and if you follow the blind, you're going to fall into a pit. It's make no bones about it. Uh, it's just like uh, there, there's two other things to, to consider, and I guess I'll wrap up unless you have other questions. But Aiken, who had stolen. Uh, what was banned in Jericho and had hit it in his tent. Most people miss a couple of key figures about that. First of all, he had been warned, don't do this. Everybody knew that going into it. And, and he did it anyway, and he stole the stuff, then he hid it, which means his family knew about it and his wife knew about it because he hid it in his tent. Mm -hmm. And the reason you know that they knew about it is that when the penalty came, even though uh, Yah, through Moses, gave him an opportunity to repent. Sorry, Joshua, not Moses. Moses was gone. Uh, he gave him the opportunity to repent and, and disclose that he had done that the night before. And he said, tomorrow we're going to appear, and he's going to choose man to man. And he did the next day. And finally, Achan confesses, and Joshua has Achan and his family including children and livestock and whatever animals they have, destroyed, stoned, and burned. Mm -hmm. And then the sad thing is, is that there were 36 men whose lives were lost when they went against the Battle of Ai just before that and found out that somebody had sinned. So Achan's sin not only destroyed his family, it wasn't just him. Mm -hmm. It was his whole family. And 36 soldiers who went to battle after he had stolen something lost their lives. And they wouldn't have lost their lives had he been faithful and everybody been following what Yah intended. Yep. There's another story. And as the, the children of Israel came out uh, and were at Sinai, and you have the 250 elected leaders that were told to come out and bring their censors, as Yah says, you know, uh, to Dathan and Abiram and uh, Korah, that whole rebellion, that situation, uh, the two didn't want to come out. They stood by their tents, and, and Moses had commanded them at Yah's instruction to have everybody gather, and that he was going to show who it was that he had selected. And uh, they were given a warning. The people of Israel were told, do not go near their tents. Stand away. Yep. 
And the reason for that is that they were swallowed. And anybody who would come in proximity would also be swallowed too. So if you're going to play with evil, you're going to get dirty. You don't play with it. If you stick a, a, a clean white glove into mud, you don't make the puddle glovey. <laughs> the glove gets muddy. Absolutely. So stay away from it. And make it public. They have been warned plenty of times. The information is there. They still have a chance to repent. Their soul is in Yah's hands. That's not our judgment. Yep. But as far as their involvement in this and being supportive of that, no. Not a chance. Don't do it. Yep. Okay. All right. Well, brother, thank you so much for this time on this. And um, thank you for the courage coming out. And the courage to everybody, you know, we're, we're always looking for any voices out there that um, need this experience out there and this. The one thing I am not is I am not afraid of, of Deborah and her evil. We have a Torah command that tells us not to fear evil and to stand up against, you know, don't be don't be scared of our enemies. And so we need to be courageous as a people and we need to come together as a people. And, you know, what what I've seen is, is that people are being fleeced and it's not just the people that are being attacked. But there's ongoing fleecing of Yah's people and on, you know, they have donations that never stop coming in and people have done auto donate and they're just making a tremendous amount of money. And people think that lives are being changed and that orphans, widows and lepers are are being changed. And there's there's not. And and that's just very, very frustrating. And and so this is why I am doing what I am doing. And 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 Ted, um, thank you so much for for this this conversation and your time. I appreciate it. Absolutely. Anybody who has a public voice, who has put, you know, HS on their site, or who has prompted people to give, you need to publicly, you don't have to go after, you don't need to document everything. You need to just simply say, you know, until this is a result, until there is a complete change and a disclosure of where these people are and what they're doing, don't support them. Yeah. Make a public declaration so that they get the message. Yeah, and it's just not, and it's not just supporting. It's that I see that they're allowing their people, the people that they're supposed to yeah. be shepherding, they're allowing them into the jaws of lions, into the jaws that exactly. will could potentially end up being a postal agent, or potentially end up being at the end of Deborah's life changing, ruining moments that she has tried to attempt on on many, many, many families. Yes. Yeah. All right. And well, I appreciate the audience, the the ability to to be able to share. And uh, you and your family and those who've been involved are continually in our prayers. Thank you, brother. Thank you. Thank you, guys. All right. Thank you so much. I'm going to end this right here. Much love to everybody out there, and goodbye.